coming to the last talk of this section, uh, session, uh, it's entitled Verifiable Distributed Aggregation Functions, and Hannah is giving the talk. Hi, I'm Hannah Davis, and I'm here to talk about my joint work with Chris Patton, Mike Rosalek, and Philip Schiltman. So the setting I want to talk about is a setting where we have a single data collector and a large number of individual clients holding private measurements. This could be something like a medical record or a URL um, in their browser history, but it's something that the client has a personal interest in, and the collector only has an interest in population level statistics. So they want to learn some aggregation function, which could be a sum of client measurements, but it could also be a mean, a variance, a histogram. There are many different options here. So the way that this problem is usually solved is just by having clients send their measurements directly to the collector and then the collector locally computes whatever population level statistics it needs. And the solution has, um, satisfies one of the two properties that we would want in this setting. It, um, it has integrity, which means the clients can't perform data poisoning. If their measurements are invalid or badly formatted, the collector will be able to tell and discard them without including them in the aggregate. However, the solution lacks privacy because the collector is learning a lot more than it needs to. So we introduce the verifiable distributed aggregation function framework. And this is an MPC setting where we have third party aggregators who are expected not to collude, who are responsible for handling both the privacy of clients and the integrity of the eventual aggregate result. Uh, this is not just a framework for all MPC solutions. We're particularly interested in settings that are scalable to large numbers of clients. Um, so we want to minimize interactions with the clients as much as possible. So in the VDAF framework, we use a specific four phase structure. In the first phase, clients split their measurements into blinded reports for each aggregator. Um, then the aggregators communicate with each other, not with the clients, um, in order to validate the formatting of those reports and make sure that each measurement is valid, even though neither aggregator can see the full measurement. Then the aggregators locally aggregate all of their individual reports and share the result with the collector, who then unifies the reports from each aggregator in order to recover the final aggregate result. Notice in this talk, I'm going to be talking about two aggregators, but in certain cases, we can look at more than two aggregators, and the framework does extend to that. Um, one other thing I'd like to point out about this before I move on is that we don't have interaction with the clients. Clients are sending a single message to each aggregator, and they don't obtain the final aggregate result. They don't see any more communication. So there's no, there should be minimal latency between clients and aggregators. But preparation, where aggregators are performing validation, can be multiple rounds. So what we expect from a verifiable distributed aggregation function is the same two properties I've been discussing. Privacy, where the collector should only learn the aggregate result and not anything more about each client's individual measurement, and integrity, where clients can lie about their own reports, but only as long as they're well formatted and they shouldn't be able to poison the final result. And we actually refer to integrity as robustness um, in our paper. So there are some already existing examples of verifiable distributed aggregation functions in the wild, and the most prominent is PRIO, um, which was developed by Dan Bonet and Henry Corrigan Gibbs. And PRIO is a generic system for um, collecting simple statistics about typically numerical data. And it was used um, during the pandemic to aggregate reports for public health authorities of how many automated notifications of COVID exposure were delivered by the Apple and Google exposure, exposure notification system. So in, in that case, this was the largest scale um, deployed system. In the initial launch, over two billion device metrics were collected, and we actually did have two independent aggregators, one of whom was run by the Internet Security Research Group, and the other was, who was run by the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. So we know that some examples of this framework can work in practice. Um, and because PRIO was so successful and was also used in other settings as well, um, the IETF 
formed a group on privacy preserving measurement and in their draft they're working on standardizing an optimized version of Creo as well as some other examples of the VDF framework. And they're the ones who first defined the syntax for verifiable distributed aggregation functions. So then we came in after draft three and we decided to include some provable security analysis in this effort to define what does it mean for VDF to be secure to make sure that we can give comparable security definitions for different examples of this cryptographic primitive and to evaluate the two candidate protocols for standardization and see do they actually meet our definition. So the first thing that we did is we gave two game-based security definitions for verifiable distributed aggregation functions. One to capture robustness and one to capture privacy. I won't go into many of the details, but I'll just say for robustness, we require all of the aggregators to be honest. Um, for privacy, we allow um, both malicious clients and we allow uh, some threshold number of malicious aggregators, which can be up to the scheme to decide what that threshold is. So I'm now I'm going to talk a little bit about how Prio 3 works. So Prio 3 is an optimized version of the Prio system. Um, so let's give a little toy example. Imagine that we're looking at one bit measurements for each client and we, the collector wants to learn the sum of these measurements. We can use linear secret sharing to split these measurements up between aggregators and then when the aggregators sum all of their individual reports, they will learn they learn nothing about individual measurements, but the collector can sum the two, sum, um, the two sums and obtain the final sum. So this satisfies privacy perfectly, but it doesn't satisfy robustness because a client could theoretically submit shares of a million rather than one or zero, and the individual aggregators have no way to tell. So Prio 3 adds fully linear zero knowledge proofs, which is just, a, in this case, a range proof for the client measurement but the proof is able to be also linearly secret shared between the two aggregators and then the aggregators can communicate in order to verify the validity of their proof shares. Um, and this is actually quite efficient. Um, so Prio 3 works not just for sums, but for a variety of other aggregation functions. Um, and so we looked at Prio 3 within a formal privacy model um, and for any aggregation function, we're able to reduce the security of the Prio 3 construction to the security of its underlying fully linear proof system. Um, we did have to change the specification slightly to achieve these results, but nothing major, no, um, everything was incorporated into the next draft of the standard without any impact on efficiency. So Poplar 1 is another example of VDAF, also developed by um, Bonet and Cork and Gibbs et al. Um, and Poplar computes histograms on bit strings. So um, the collector now holds an additional parameter, which is a set of prefix bit strings. And it should be able to obtain counts of how many times each prefix shows up among client measurements. So for example, if F contains the bit strings 00, zero and 01, zero we see 00. zero shows up as a prefix in three measurements, zero one shows up as a prefix in none. And we can ask, why do we need another histogram protocol? I mentioned on a prior slide, Creo 3 also does histograms, but there's some distinct differences. Um, so Poplar 1 is actually a subroutine of the Poplar protocol, which is designed to solve the heavy hitters problem, asking how many client bit strings appear at least a threshold number of times in the data set without learning anything about the uh, bit strings that appeared less than that threshold number of times. So in order to solve the heavy hitters problem, the full Poplar protocol runs Poplar 1 over and over again using different values of S and different prefix lengths. Um, and the trick is in order to minimize client interaction, we want to be able to compute many histograms for different values of S using the same client reports. And so that's what Poplar 1 does that Prio 3 doesn't. The other difference is that Prio 3 requires the buckets, so the values in S to be known to the clients, and Poplar 1 makes sure that this data is private because it can um, include some privacy leakage if it's run multiple times the way it is in Poplar. So I won't go into the details of 
how popular one works, but it uses function secret sharing to compute many histograms from one report. And unfortunately, the way that it validates its reports takes two rounds between the aggregators rather than one. So we introduce a new protocol called Doppler, which is an, a variant of Poplar that only um, requires one round of communication for validation. Um, and it does this by using a verifiable function secret sharing technique from DeCastro and Kaniadu. And um, we also take the fully linear proofs from Pre-03 and we make them delayed input, which means that the client doesn't have to know um, what measurements it's proving. And this is really important for Poplar 1 in order to protect the privacy of the values in S. So given these changes, we um, also proved privacy and robustness for Doppler in the same game-based model. And um, I guess one thing I should mention is although Doppler has reduced round complexity, it does have greater bandwidth and communication costs. So there is, there is some trade-off there where um, we think that it's possible to make it more efficient, but um, that would require some more looking into how delayed input fully linear proofs work. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Okay, um, if not, then let, let me pause one. The, I, I hope I understood it correctly. So the, your, your framework is not restricted to two aggregators. Or right. It? Okay, right. so we, we can. Have, so I, I wondered if, um, because the, the use case you were aiming for is many, many clients, huh? and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the idea is that they have their inputs and they share these inputs among these aggregators. So would it make sense, or could it be realized that, um, that you're using actually and then a sharing scheme, let's say an um, K out of N sharing scheme, yeah? so that you say, okay, I mean, we let's say we have 10 aggregators, yeah, but for whatever reason, two aggregators haven't received the shares of, of a certain client, but they could still maybe reconstruct everything. I think that would be possible for certain applications. I'm not sure how exactly the validity checking would work. I don't know if there's K out of N fully linear proof um, constructions, but yeah, it, within the VDAF framework that's definitely achievable. Okay. Okay. You have another chance to ask questions? Maybe just check through it again, but I think they want coffee. coffee. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry. No, okay. No, okay. Then um, thanks a lot for, for the interesting talk, and thanks again to you and all the other speakers.